Hello again, everyone, and uh, welcome back. Uh, this is Patty, and it is my great uh, privilege and honor to introduce my special guest today, Matthew Roman, Chief Digital Officer at Duke Health. Matt, what a pleasure to have you on our show, and welcome. Hey, good afternoon, Patty. Uh, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to uh, talk to you again. Thank you. Uh, you're most welcome. So why don't we get started with uh, maybe a little bit of an overview of Duke Health, uh, the populations that you serve, and your role in the uh, organization. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, uh, I have the pleasure of serving as the Chief Digital Strategy Officer for Duke University Health System. It is um, a medium-sized, uh, but uh, a very uh, high-quality academic medical center. We're pretty proud of the quality of care we offer here. Uh, we have three hospitals in our system. Uh, we're, we're located in the center of North Carolina. Uh, and so we have um, the flagship academic hospital and two community hospitals, and then a, a large series of um, clinics, both primary care and, um, and uh, a large specialty, specialty faculty practice as well. Um, I, um, I report in to the chief information officer, uh, and we uh, support the academic mission through the schools of medicine and nursing as well as the health system functions. So you have, so the mission includes uh, the education side of it, the research side of it, and also the healthcare delivery organization, which is kind of typical for any AMC, I guess. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so, uh, so in your role as Chief Digital Strategy Officer, maybe you could give us a little bit of an overview of the digital programs that are currently in flight at uh, Duke Health Maybe touch upon one or two things, the telehealth, for instance, which uh, has been a big growth area for most organizations. So maybe you could give us an overview, Matt. Sure, sure. Uh, our digital strategy office was formed uh, about three and a half years ago. It's the vision of our uh, chief information officer, who's a physician himself. Um, and so uh, we are responsible for uh, sort of... Um, uh, consumer-friendly, patient-facing technologies to help with our patients' uh, attempts to engage with us as a health system. We're taking a, an approach where we're we're in the in the deep in the throes of um, of implementing a number of what I would call foundational technology platforms, on which over the next uh, couple of years we'll build uh, hopefully more and more and more uh, more effective and broader-reaching uh, uh, use cases. So these platforms include uh, some of which are fully embedded already, some of which are in flight. Uh, as you mentioned, Patty, uh, our telehealth platform, which everybody in the country has to have now. Um, we're responsible for our patient portal and are doing some things around the patient portal to improve our, our experience of the patients. Uh, a CRM strategy, a strategy around conversational AI and chatbot. Uh, a strategy where we reach out to the patients to learn from them what they want from us. Uh, we're doing this through a virtualized patient advisory council. Some of some others have done this as well too. Uh, and remote patient monitoring, both in support of the uh, telehealth uh, platform, the visits of today that are conducted virtually, but also in support of, um, of uh, continuing care, even if that care is delivered in person, we're able to then through these remote patient monitoring strategies, uh, capture data points and great, much greater frequency uh, to support clinical decision making and predictive modeling and such. Yeah, that's uh, those are clearly the the top uh, foundational platforms for a lot of uh, health systems, and we'll you know we'll unpack all of that. Uh, uh, but let's start let's start with telehealth. Uh, what have been the uh, what have been the volumes? And I know everyone had a spike during the mm. pandemic, but that's also dropping off a little bit and maybe reaching some level of equilibrium. And obviously the questions around how it, you know, how patients are responding to it. And of course, how caregivers are responding to it as well uh, from the point of view of training, you know, workflows and so on. Talk to us a little bit about what that experience has been like and uh, feel free to you know, talk about any platforms that you've used to, to execute on it and your whole strategy, are you using one, are you using multiple platforms for different things? How do they all fit with your other tools that you talked about, uh, especially the EHR uh, platform, but also other tools uh, that are involved in delivering the seamless experience for patients? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so we had an experience like most others. Uh, we were uh, we had a pretty small telehealth footprint. We had some early adopters pre-pandemic. Uh, some really impressive work, though, uh, pre-pandemic. Um, for instance, our movement disorder clinic uh, had a, has a neurologist that um, was a very early adopter uh, of um, of telehealth. His patients are ALS patients who have tremendous movement and mobility disorders, and it's it takes an army to bring them to our clinic and. And he has a he has a pretty wide um, um, uh, capture rate or capture geography, and so he was able to uh, we were able to work with him to enable video visits of these patients. It was a tremendous satisfier, very white glove, uh, very high touch uh, at the time on, on our side. Uh, of course, we had the same hockey stick uh, increase in volume as everybody else did in March of last year. We went from. No kidding now, no, uh, we went from 100 visits a month to uh, 2,000 visits a day, uh, much like everybody else. Uh, we, like uh, I've seen from colleagues around the country in the last couple of months, have seen uh, these numbers uh, tail. Uh, the truth is our highest month volume since the start of the pandemic was March of 2021. Uh, and, and then we've, and since March, we've uh, started to tail off just a little bit. We remain, uh, we continue to have pretty high volume in some specialties. Our behavioral health and psychiatry clinics have remained um, a very high adopters of high utilizers of. Um, our primary care clinics are, uh, are continuing to, to be strong here. Certainly some of the um, uh, specialty and surgery clinics as well. Uh, we have a primary platform that's embedded in our, in our electronic health record. And we have a backup platform too. So we are able to um, capture if in fact a person doesn't have the, a, a, a patient doesn't have an app on their device or act, has some connectivity issues, then we can rescue or salvage that uh, by sending a, a rescue link. And so we have uh, two active platforms that we're working with currently. You also mentioned uh, chatbots. Uh, so have you been using them more in the context of clinical chats or more in, in an administrative context, let's say for enabling access and providing patients with information and self-service tools and what, or, or are you doing both? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we're we're uh, in the very relatively early stages of implementing our chatbot and we're, we're cutting our teeth on administrative functions. Uh, we, um, uh, we, will, we will tread lightly in uh, offering clinical advice through artificial intelligence, um, just more from a, a risk tolerance uh, and um, uh, quality assurance perspective than anything else, I think. But um, we're, we're starting from an administrative place, uh, to your point, uh, access, um, some instructions, directions, uh, wayfinding, uh, uh, touchless arrival, these sorts of things, and then we'll, uh, we'll branch from there. So is the, is the approach to, uh, maybe start small, you know, establish uh, adoption levels and make sure that the chats will work effectively and people feel comfortable with it before you start going the more complex and maybe more high stakes, high risk kind of uh, functions. Is that the approach? Well, that's right. And we're also working very hard with these, uh, you know, the secret sauce about mm -hmm. these platforms is not the platform themselves, but making certain that we know, for instance, if a patient has a remote monitoring device in their home or, or monitoring their blood pressure via, via home, home checks, and then they engage with us via chatbot, that our chatbot response is informed by the fact that they actually are a remote monitored patient and we can get smart to our answer. And we would answer that patient differently via artificial intelligence, knowing that they had a, an RPM device than if we knew that that patient didn't. And so it's this connection between these platforms that's really so intriguing to me. Yeah, let's let's talk about uh, CRM. You mentioned that, and uh, you know, you and I have spoken before on this. Uh, where are you in your CRM journey? Uh, it's, this it seems to be when I look across the landscape, you know, people are in different stages of deploying an enterprise class CRM platform and really using that to transform their patient experiences. Uh, could you talk a little bit about where you are in the journey and what are some of your focus areas with the CRM sure. platform? Sure. The first, uh, we've we've implemented an enterprise level CRM in our um, in our Duke Health marketing shop. So we do that. That was our first uh, stretch into the CRM, and it was a number of years ago. 
And since then, uh, we have an outfit here called the Duke Clinical Research Organization. It's a large CRO. Uh, so they have an installation of uh, the same CRM tool um, that uh, helps them manage trials. This, they manage multi-center trials, not just uh, site-based research. And they do a bunch of work in, in, their, in the CRM, uh, in that DCRI unit too. And now we're in the 11th hour of our um, implementation of the CRM tool in our access services center. And so we have um, we have a, 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 a an access services center that has multiple hubs that basically serves all of our uh, primary and specialty care providers. Uh, they take a they take uh, two to almost three million calls a year and schedule um, one to two million appointments a year out of that access service center. And so you do that math real quickly. It's almost two calls per appointment. And so what we are hoping to do is be able to get a little bit smarter in our in our engagement, knowing what we knowing who the patients are, knowing who's calling, and knowing the call history, which right now we don't have much insight into, which we'll be able to with the CRM. Um, and I can envision very very easily um, patient acquisition efforts from the marketing effort marketing shop within with the CRM tool. Uh, and helping to create journeys from when we acquire a patient at very first to when we actually schedule that patient for a desired or needed or requested services to then linking them to the uh, portal and other things that we have downstream so that we can consistently engage with our patients, uh, know about them, know about every encounter we've had with them clinically and administratively uh, to reduce friction and lower the barrier for entry. So, uh have you started seeing results from this uh, uh, implementation, especially in the, the contact center operations? Yeah, the honest truth is our contact center will, will go live in August. So um, we're, we're deep in the implementation phase. Um, so I, uh, let's talk in a year and I'll hopefully have great stories for you. Well, all the best too with that, with that color. I know, I know how those things go. So I just want to touch on the last uh, foundation of platform that you mentioned, which is uh, remote monitoring. And again, uh, you mentioned that in the context of uh, a chronic disease, and you know that's where most of the deployments have been from an RPM standpoint. Uh, how has it worked so far, especially the, the aspects where you bring back the data from the devices and the sensors and so on, and, and you're trying to combine that uh, with uh, patient longitudinal records in the EHR, trying to make sense of it and trying to uh, move the needle from, from the point of view managing their chronic conditions. How has that worked so far? Any learnings that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, we, we're taking an approach that um, RPM has uh, two really big buckets. This is almost uh, oversimplified. The first bucket is to replicate what, you, what hap has happened for generations when we walk into our provider's office. We get weight and core temperature and, and height and blood pressure and heart rate and, and all these sorts of things. And so, um, uh, so we can replicate that when the when the visit occurs via video, by remote capture, just to just to continue to be able to capture the same sort of quality data that we have for generations. Um, perhaps more importantly, though, is um, uh, when a, when when our providers are being asked to make clinical decisions based on a single data point or or a very precious few data points over a long longitudinal time point, um, then I feel like that we're, we're, um, we're under-informed in these decisions. So the we're, we're, um, way we're structuring it is uh, we send patients home with uh, whatever the appropriate biomedical or, sorry, biometric kit might be, be it uh, blood pressure, glucose monitoring, or pulse oximeter, et cetera. Um, bring these data in to a uh, repository or a lake short of our uh, electronic health record where we can uh, analyze the data. We can um, apply rules to uh, trigger alerts. These will be alerts to the provider team, to the care team, if there's a, either a series of or a sequence of um, progressively out of range numbers or, a, um, or an alert or a, range, or a value that's particularly high or low that's uh, somewhat dangerous that we wanna inter um, intervene with or, and uh, send alerts to patients. And these might be an alert to patient because we haven't re received a value in a few days or because the values are trending um, well and we want to send them an, a nudge that says, congratulations, good job, 
the work you're doing is, is being effective and your blood pressure is becoming under control, you've lost five pounds, whatever. Or the reverse, if the, if the uh, trends are actually going in the wrong direction, we wanna send an encouraging message uh, to help them to get back on course, to help them in the provider titrate medicines, to help them in the provider uh, change some course in one way or another. And then of course the long game is um, once we capture enough of these data points across a broad enough um, segment of our population that's representative enough, then we'll know, um, we'll be able to get smart about what normal recovery looks like after a procedure, about what normal or well looks like, about when uh, a, a, a variant in the data is actually meaningful or when it's um, a predictable variant that's uh, innocuous. And so we'll, we have, um, we're blessed to have really, really tremendous data science people around here to uh, be able to look at these big data sets and find the, um, the pearls in them. Uh, so we'll be able to work to uh, set up predictive models to understand when uh, data are indicating that action should really be taken. Uh, this also has, um, I think, a workflow utility because we can then even tell patients in advance when we're comfortable with this modeling. You can expect something like this to occur on you know, somewhere between day four and six after you've gotten home. I'm making up an example. Yeah. Uh, but that's what we're, that's the journey we're on. Well, uh, this is obviously a great segue to uh, my next question, which is going to be about data and analytics and how you're driving that. I imagine that, uh, you know, RPM is just one of many use cases uh, for data and analytics. But can you talk to us about how you're set up uh, specifically as it relates to data and analytics to serve the multiple needs of the enterprise. You have a centralized data and analytics function, uh, you know, and you mentioned predictive models, uh, artificial intelligence. That's again a term that you know everybody uses, and, and success rates have varied widely uh, depending upon the use case, depending upon the institution. Could you give us a little bit of state of the union, or you know, just share a little bit of what what successes uh, you've had and how you're structured? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll speak to this as a consumer of these uh, these real, uh, really very brilliant people that, it, that I have the pleasure of working with. Um, one of my peers is a chief analytics officer. And uh, so he and his team are responsible for, um, for all the structure. Uh, I did mention the lake that's in place that, um, you know, I oversimplify it um, uh, and they would do a much better job of describing what we're doing there. But that lake, of course, is uh, able for us to, uh, is, is built in such a way for us to be able to pile in multiple, multiple data streams. So in the very near term future, we'll have an ability to inform our, our clinical decisions on things beyond just the very rich electronic health record data. There are tons of things in the electronic health record, but it's incomplete, of course. Mm -hmm. So in this um, lake, um, will be or repository, we'll have RPM data, we'll have social determinant data. As data become more and more available on other social things, expense, spend, um, you know, these sorts of things, we'll, we'll be able to put these, these data sets in there too. You would know as well or better than me that zip code is a, as powerful a predictor as medication list of certain outcomes clinically. And so we'll have these social drivers in there. Uh, I think we'll be able to put in geofencing and geolocation data uh, as part of our remote monitoring uh, journey. All of this, of course, with consent of patients. Um, and if we, if we do this with, if we do with these data as we should, then the patients become um, a great beneficiary of the work we're doing here. Yeah, I, I'd love to go into that in maybe in another podcast conversation. But there's so much there to unpack and so much there to uh, discuss origin data sources and you know what's a better predictor uh, right. versus something else and so on. Well, let me, let me come back to, uh, now you mentioned you know, your, your role and it reports up into the CIO. I'm just curious, could you talk to us um, a little bit about the org model for driving mm -hmm. digital transformation? How's it structured? You know, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I report into the CIO. I am not a deep technician, I'm not an engineer. Uh, I come at this from a clinical angle. I'm, I'm, um, I'm a clinician first and a, and a strategist and a di digital health person second. Um, 
Uh, I uh, have a team that's relatively small. We're responsible for our portal, as I mentioned. Um, we have, um, we have uh, uh, people with broad um, uh, backgrounds. We have, uh, uh, we have a nurse on our team. We have a physician who serves as our medical director. We have um, people trained specifically in clinical informatics. We have a couple of other physical therapists. Um, so a, a broad uh, and diverse team. We work very carefully and closely with operational colleagues um, in the health system, clinical and operational leads uh, to uh, understand the opportunities that, the, that our clinicians are experiencing, um, to find um, what I would like to call clever use of technology to ease their workflow, to ease the ability to, for them to engage with the patients, to empower the patients uh, with information and with tools to uh, supplement their care in between clinical encounters. And so while I report in through and our budget is through uh, our IT shop, uh, we do nothing uh, and would never try to do anything without our operational colleagues um, uh, to actually be able to implement workflow, to be able to set appropriate impact metrics, to be able to have um, baseline data against which to compare. Uh, I call them impact metrics because it's not just about numbers of adoption of this tool or that. It's about, you know, what difference did we make? What does it matter that we have a million people on our portal account? If, if in fact, you know, there's no impact of having a million people there except yeah. two commas in the number. Um, and so um, we work extremely collaboratively on a daily basis with um, the clinical ops leads uh, who are at the uh, tip of the spear. Let's talk about the tech, right? You're obviously uh, you know, deeply engaged with uh, the technology stack and the technology vendors who help you. How, are you, how do you approach the technology choices for your transformation? Uh, you know, for instance, you've got your electronic health record, which does a lot of things, but you've also got an enterprise class CRM platform and, and maybe specialized tools for RPM and some of the other things that you talked about. And you have a choice. So you you know you can go to the big tech firms. Uh, you could go at the other end to extremely small, nimble, and innovative startups, and a whole range in between. How do you parse through those choices, and how do you approach them, especially when it comes to the risks uh, for innovation? Yeah, that's a that's a question that candidly I wrestle with every single day. I imagine. <laughs> Uh, we have invested mightily in our uh, electronic health record, um, and that's mightily in dollars and, and, um, and effort. Um, and I think we have a very mature installation of our inter enterprise electronic health record. Um, however, it's a, it's a transactional system. It is, it is the system of record. It houses our legal medical record, and it is responsible for um, the, the actual transactions. And that's important and that's really critical and we don't break that, right? We also work extremely hard um, because our clinicians of all stripes are very, very busy. And so we have, a, we have a concept that I was taught by our prior CTO who calls it a, it's a classic term, you know, single pane of glass. And, um, and, uh, and so we, we have a fairly high bar for we'll ask our providers um, or our clinical staff or our administrative staff uh, whose uh, day is in the electronic health record. It's a fairly high bar for us to say, for this purpose, go to another application. And so uh, when, we, uh, when we want to bring in another application, we try very hard to allow us to be able to launch it from within the primary health record, the place where uh, where uh, the, the, our staff are working all the time. We insist on single sign-on capabilities. Uh, we insist on being able to uh, preserve um, contextual awareness. If I'm working with this patient in the health record and I launch uh, application B, I should be able to find patient B, the same patient in application B without any effort to reduce errors and such. Um, but it is, um, you know, I, I would tell you that we, our pendulum swings all the time between inter high level enterprise solutions and fit for purpose. And um, it's, a, it's an eternal struggle. Um, so all that to 
say is I know I'm not answering your question clearly, but uh, it is the it is the, maybe the unanswerable one. Yeah, well, when it comes to uh, you know uh, innovation and innovative uh, technologies, now I know you have your own innovation group within the organization within you, and then of course there's there's a lot of innovation that is happening right now in the market. There's the billions and billions in venture capital money, for instance, going to innovative start. Many of them have very interesting solutions. Uh, and, but sometimes it can be overwhelming to parse through all of that to find that little nugget. Uh, or when you do find that nugget for reasons beyond your control or their control, they might fail uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, when you, so let's say I have a startup founder who comes to me and say, look, you know, I want to talk to Matt. I have this really, really interesting solution, which I think is going to make his life and his patient's lives uh, easier. How do I, how do I approach Matt and what is he looking for? So what is, what is the answer you would give to someone like that? Yeah, with startups, um, um, I tend to say uh, some of this advice is unwelcome to startups. Uh, one bit is, uh, for a complex organization like ours, uh, the sales cycle is longer than you, the startup, or I would like it to be. Uh, but it's just the reality. Uh, we work very hard to shorten it, but um, there's, it's complex. And I'm not saying it's right, but the reality is it takes a long time. So be patient is one. Um, two is um, uh, I, I think that the point that we made a moment ago about respect the single pane of glass as much as possible is important even if that widget is uh, just simply remarkable and uh, game changing, if we can't get it in front of the users, and I mean the busy clinicians, I also mean the patients, um, uh, then it won't matter, right? Uh, in other words, um, uh, there is, I don't know what the number is, but there is, there is a tipping point where we can put too many applications on a patient's device, and then it becomes noise rather than signal. And then, uh, you know, a patient who has comorbid conditions and we have three or four or whatever the number is, really magical applications that, um, that could stand to change that patient's course. Uh, if we don't ever, if we don't, if we can't elegantly um, get that patient to interact with that application, then, then it's somewhat meaningless. Um, so patients, um, single pane of glass integration, which should be easier and easier as time passes because of fire standards and smart application capabilities and these sorts of things. Um, and um, uh, undersell and over deliver, right? And by that, I mean, is, yeah, it's somewhat obvious. It's, um, um, you know, if it's a niche product, it's a niche product, um, but um, uh, it's, but the other side of that continuum is the large company or the or the medium-sized company who comes into an organization like this one and says we can solve all your problems. That's somewhat of a um, an oversale. Yeah, and I would I would I would be suspicious. Yeah, yeah, well, that's good advice. That is good advice. We are uh, we're coming up to the end of our time here, and I have one last question uh, for you, Matt. Based on your experience over the last few years that you've been in this role, and uh, you've clearly seen a lot of uh, progress, and you've had your share of successes, and I'm, I'm sure you've had your share of things that didn't go as you planned it to be. What's your one or two pieces of uh, advice uh, or best practices that you would like to share with your peers in the industry who are on similar transformation journeys? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, one. Um... I love the question, um, and I would answer it by saying, um, uh, be persistent, be tenacious, um, don't stop. Um, I won't tell you that I have best practices because this is a personal semantic question for me. I don't like that term because it implies I already, I already have what's best and it can't get better. And so um, the, to me, the answer is tenacity, um, try something, carefully monitor the impact, make a change, try something again. Um, uh, that's, um, I happen to think that's the key. Um, don't be afraid to, to, uh, to try something new. Be obviously cautious and be obviously judicious in these changes because we're talking about patient safety. Uh, but um, uh, where possible, 
the classic fail fast mentality to me is 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 wise. Yeah. And then fail once fast. you failed, then you change and and learn and reapply. Right. But don't necessarily move fast and break things. Is the Absolutely. is the subtext? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you, and thank you so much for sharing all of those insights. Uh, once again, all the best with the upcoming Go Live. I know it's going to be a big one for you, and uh, I look forward to following all of the work and, and the progress that uh, you made. Once again, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Penny. Thank you for all you do. Appreciate you.